So uh, good evening and welcome to Capturing the Face of Finance, which is a panel that uh, it's not at the concluding event of the day, but it, uh, I guess it kind of concludes a day focused on financialization related topics, but um, here explored uh, more specifically maybe from the point of view of artistic practices, methodologies, strategies. And uh, it asks questions such as uh, the possibilities of navigating conflation of capital, geography, and information, and also if we can capture the hidden algorithmic computation and infrastructures that this is based upon. And uh, Ruth Ketlow will be the moderator of this session. And uh, she's an artist and curator working with, uh, well, further field, uh, uh, co which is co-director and, and, and uh, co-founder of, uh, together with Mark Garrett. Uh, for, further field has been especially focusing also on these kind of topics. Um, they uh, released a book also that was featured here, Artists Rethinking the, the Blockchain, but they have a program, or I'm not sure if it's still running, called Art uh, Data Money that has several uh, outputs such as exhibitions, publications, a film, uh, and other activities. Um, so before giving the word over to you, I'd also like to thank the Willem Flusser Archive at the University of the Arts here in Berlin for their cooperation in also realizing the project of uh, Francesco and Oliver, or uh, the Demystification Committee, uh, sorry, to maybe reveal your names. Um, some demystification here. Uh, and yeah, that's it, I guess. Uh, the, yeah, thank you. Give them a hand. Thanks, Christopher. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, lovely to have you all here. Um, so I'm going to be setting the scene a little bit uh, briefly. Then we'll have a presentation from uh, Zachary followed by a presentation from the Demystification Committee. And there should be a time for 20 minutes, half an hour of questions at the end and discussion. Um, so, capturing the face of finance. Uh, definition always helps, doesn't it? So, finance is the coordination of large amounts of money or capital. And the definition tells us that this is usually by uh, states or corporations. And it's said to comprise about a fifth of the entire global economy. So, uh, so the yeah the the business of finance takes up about uh, accounts for about a fifth of the global economy. And this percentage is uh, unsurprisingly unequally distributed across the nations of the planet. Um, so, in the UK, for instance, it actually accounts for somewhere nearer 28 percent. Um, one role of art, in common with all forms of ritual, is to make the invisible visible. And while the decisions of individuals and companies acting within financial systems can effectively terraform huge swathes of surfaces of the planet and all who live on it, finance still operates in a state of high abstraction for most of us. So... Um, I'm not an academic, so I've decided I'm just going to talk from, uh, starting from a TV program that I saw the other night with my dad, okay? So I saw this TV program called uh, The Search for the Lost Girl, and we were shown, I'm not going to tell you about the whole thing, but there was something that really kind of struck me. So we were shown two photographs, aerial views of the Sumatran forest taken 20 years apart. Uh, the first one, 
uh, shows an entire country covered with ancient rainforests and all of the super biodiversity that they would support. And film footage from the ground, uh, taken in 1997, shows a small group of the indigenous Orang Rimba people walking uh, kind of magically in dappled light through the forest undergrowth in a kind of blaring sound of birds, uh, insects, and who knows what animals. Uh, another aerial view taken just this year shows this same land replaced with uniform grids of palm oil crops over hundreds of thousands of acres with just small islands, reservations. The, the, so now that these small islands of forests are now referred to as reservations. Um, and the TV from the ground is silent. So this noise, this, this complex noise is now reduced to silence. Uh, and we learn through the TV program that there's been, so now there's this sudden break in tens of thousands of years of cultural continuity of, the, of this nomadic Orang Rimba, Ringa people. And these are the human players in that biodiversity. And with them, uh, we can uh, understand that we have the loss of a relational diversity and the textures and content, contents of the knowledge and consciousness that's born out of the place and the abundant living system. So this is just like everything just closed down. Um, the best outcome for the individual indigenous people that we're kind of, that are shown in this program is apparently to transition to participation in a consumer society in which all living systems must be mediated through the logic of capital in order to be valued or to have any meaning at all. So I watch this TV program and then I get on the tube in London and I see these kind of very highly glossy pictures of different exoticized natural kind of natural plants that I can buy kind of mashed into different formats sold to me via, via cosmetic and they're they're kind of delicious and I can smell them in my you know I can imagine smelling them and then I'm taken back to this kind of tv program and it's okay so this is difficult um, so we can see some of the impacts of some of the operations of global finance working and it's kind of like it's just like magic it's like this a wand is waved, everything wiped out. But its mechanisms, its players, and the places where it operates, and how they connect to the places that they affect, are often surrounded with a deep sense of mystery. And it's the kind of mystery that I associate with kind of the will of the distant, omnipotent God of my childhood. Okay, these changes happen, who knows how. Um, Mark Garrett suggests and I think this is interesting to think about, uh, that in contemporary digital globalization and its systems of communication and financial control that we're all now indigenous. Um, I'm putting that out there, let's think about that. Okay, so to come back to the idea of rituals, so what rituals can be performed to restore a greater diversity of communalities, relations and survival skills for ourselves and other life, life forms under the current systems that we have? Um, so Brett Scott, who some of you will know, who's the author of The Heretic's Guide to Finance, uh, in his book and through his workshops and activities, demonstrates and recounts a range of strategies for getting to know the world of finance. So you can get employed. So he was employed by and lived like a kind of undercover anthropologist amongst the financial classes to study their cultures and instruments. Uh, then afterwards runs a series of jargon-busting, playful hacking events with others of the images, tools, and infrastructures of this world. Uh, at one event, he asked us what image we saw in our mind's eye when we thought of money or finance. And uh, I suggest you do that now. Okay, just what images are in your mind? I'm not going to ask you to tell me, but just... Um, I googled finance and money this year, I've done it a year before, it doesn't change. It's, they're, they're always kind of, kind of branded, kind of some gradient of blue, uh, often the cuffs of a businessman, or always man's hands operating calculators or pointing at graphs or, and then sometimes it's stacks of gold. 
uh, but like very homogenous images. In my mind's eye, I have angry stock traders. That was the image I had in my mind's eye. Um, so we worked with Brett on a public, public weekend event to collaboratively change the image of finance by inviting people who hadn't really thought that much about money, beyond wanting it, I expect, uh, to create a mood board of mythic money and future finance. And we built a kind of alternative in, in, image of finance. And this involved a whole variety of things like uh, doges, uh, as in dogecoin doges in papal gowns, uh, kind of benevolent distributors of funds to happy populations. Uh, remade notes, of, of, often figuring the kind of disfigured heads of state or hybrid animals, all kinds of things. Uh, Brett's workshops uh, engage, engage coders, historians, economists, marketeers, artists, philosophers, business people, like he does diversity really well, uh, to use, to define and start, he, he, he's run this series which is to define and to start to build the alternative or activist Bloomberg terminal. So the Bloomberg ter terminal, for those that don't know, is the interface used by uh, traders to gain access to live market data and commentary. And I just learned this morning, talking to someone who will not be named, that Bloomberg in London... Uh, so Bloomberg, these are the, the leading provider of global financial data live. Uh, they've just recently opened to the public a Roman temple of Mithras uh, at the top of their at the top of their kind of main uh, London headquarters, and this is an early Roman kind of cult, straight religion, and the central image of Mithras is. The, a killing of the bull by cutting the throat and you see the blood billowing and spilling out. It, it, that's worth Googling, actually. Uh, but, so this is, this is kind of interesting. And at each event, Brett would retell the story of the evolution of money and finance from the kind of primordial soup to the present day. It's kind of like the retelling of the creation myth of money. Uh, of a world made of money. And it was always kind of a bit hopeless, but a generous quest to offer a more accessible narrative pathway through this territory so that so many of us feel is not for us. Um, so through this, we discover first principles about the function of money, very ubiquitous, but still so mysterious. And we become more acquainted with the affordances of the highly abstract and often shady world of finance and its instruments. So, the invitation is to see these systems as territories that we can claim, to make our homes there, and to reinsert our own values, and to bridge to our own localities and communities, so to really kind of start to familiarise ourselves, uh, which brings us to today's speakers. Um, and... The work that we're going to see or hear spoken about today kind of makes visible the materials, the energies, and the rituals of these worlds and connects us with the kind of real strangeness, I think, of experience on the ground of these worlds while uh, kind of, um, I think, also maintaining the mystery, which is also important. So we'll start with Zachary Formwalt. Uh, lovely to have you here. So. Zachary is an artist and filmmaker based in Amsterdam. He's presented solo projects at the Salon, Salon of the Museum of Contemporary Art in Belgrade, the Stedelijk Museum Bureau Amsterdam, Wexner Center for the Arts, the Box Columbus, uh, Kunsthalle in Basel. And in 2013, he received a Tiger Award for his film Unsupported Transit at the International Film Festival in Rotterdam. Thank you. <clears throat> Okay. Um, it's not. The, yeah, it's uh, it's a blank. <laughs> so there's a little drama with the reveal. <laughs> uh, so I'm I'm not going to try to present any revelations about the inner workings of finance. Uh, I want to rather take up a couple of surfaces where representation of finance has fairly recently been attempted. So I'm going to begin with these two images. Each depicts a stock exchange. The one on your left is located in Amsterdam. I hope that's right. Yeah, it is your left. 
Uh, the one on the right is in Shenzhen, in China. Neither of these exchanges were in operation when these photographs were taken. This is the former Amsterdam Stock Exchange Hall in the Burs von Berlacher, which opened in the first years of the 20th century. Designed by a socialist architect, the traders never liked it and left less than 10 years after it had opened. The building had been designed to outlive capitalism and eventually become a Volkspolis, a house for the people. Though this never happened, the owners of the building now use this story, along with a number of other anecdotes about its history, to market it as a unique venue for staging elaborate parties, conferences, and product launches. Their tagline, Welcome to the Exchange of Stories, plays on its history as a kind of stockpile of stories that one can choose from to anecdotally situate or introduce a given event. The place where the king was married, where options trading got its first dedicated European market in the 1970s, where the stock trader snubbed its socialist architect, abandoning it within a few years of its opening, or where Occupy Amsterdam was situated in 2011 and 12 to take up just a few possibilities. This composite photograph, a screenshot from Google Street View, is used to advertise the venue. Access to the former trading floors is restricted to those renting them for a given event, with the exception of a guided tour that takes place once a month. So access is limited, but it is possible to see it. And then, of course, there's Google Maps, where you can virtually walk through the building, look around, zoom in and out to see different details of the wall ornamentation, etc. So several years ago, the owners of the building announced that it had finally become a people's house, as its architect had originally intended. If you can't afford it or are not invited, you can, of course, become a part of this people through the wonders of Google Street View. There is obviously no Google Street View image of the Shenzhen Stock Exchange exterior, much less of the interior. Maybe in the future, if it too becomes a former exchange building. But for now, this relatively new building is not made available to a public in this way. If you do come across an image of the interior, it was more than likely taken in this space, the so-called listings hall, which was designed as a kind of stage for photographs and videos to be made of the listing ceremonies when new companies are first officially traded on the exchange. In the year leading up to the opening of this building for exchange activities, I took this photograph from a platform that had been designed for a small invited audience and for press photographers to witness these ceremonies. The finishing touches on the interior were being made at this time. They were testing the screens. Occasionally somebody would walk by and ding the bell. And I assumed at the time that this was the bell that would actually be used to open the trading day once the exchange began operating there. But it turned out to be a stand-in. There should be sound with that, but I don't know, maybe the... Uh, so this footage is from a CCTV America broadcast showing the bell they actually use in the listing ceremony that some trading days begin with. It's hanging in the same place as the smaller one in front of the massive LED screen, which here displays an inanimate fireworks graphic. That graphic is replaced by this familiar display of market figures once the ceremony is over. And this can then be intercut throughout the story and also serve as a backdrop for shots like this. <laughs> so I had first gotten access to this site in 2011 when it looked like this. The bell had not yet arrived, but there was a mock-up of the large LED screens that now hang in the space. A textile with an image of graphs and market data printed on it, stretched around a wooden box. which was then suspended from the ceiling. At that time, I got access to a couple of the key vantage points on neighboring buildings from which the architects were documenting the progress being made on the construction of the building. 
I made a film that was in part about the genre of time-lapse films documenting the progress on construction sites, which are often used as a figure of urban development more broadly. With a time-lapse film, a long process is condensed into a short period of time. And this is done mechanically, or you could even say algorithmically, not through an editing process where exceptional moments are selected and then sequenced. With time-lapse, you simply speed up the rate at which a piece of footage is played back. You play it back at a faster frame rate than it was filmed at. One photograph might be taken each day and then played back at 24 photographs a second so that a process taking four years can be seen in about a minute. This then becomes a kind of record or evidence of the construction process. If you were to expose each photograph in the same way that you expose a single frame in a film shot at the normal rate, then you would end up with a lot of noise, basically, from all the little things moving around the building. To avoid this, a longer exposure time is used so that all the faster movements disappear and you are left with an image of a building that is built without any actual work. The labor disappears in this final record of the construction process. The technique of time-lapse photography, the aesthetic standards and expectations of what makes a good, noise-free record reproduce this image of the built environment as something that occurs at a distance from actual human labor. So it relates to what is going on daily in the stock markets as well, to the extent that they function at a remove from traditional forms of labor. The capital is accumulated there, as Marx put it, in its most superficial form, where it seemingly avoids the production process altogether, and profit is achieved through purely financial processes. If an image of this superficial form of capital is suggested and reproduced in time-lapse films of urban development, and this was a major point for me in this film called Unsupported Transit, where I tied this back to some technical problems in the development of instantaneous photography and the mythical motivation for Edward Muybridge's experiments of photographing a horse in movement to prove that there is indeed a, mo a moment of so-called unsupported transit when all four of a horse's hooves are simultaneously off the ground something which the human eye cannot see, but that photography could, it turned out, capture. That momentary flight, an overcoming of gravity through the momentum of a horse's forward movement, and this idea of a form of capital that is able to accumulate without touching the ground of production, was something that the Shenzhen Stock Exchange building was designed to explicitly celebrate. In the words of its architects, and this is a quote from the OMA website, the building was designed by Rem Kohlhaas' firm, OMA. The essence of the stock market is speculation. It is based on capital, not material. The Shenzhen Stock Exchange is conceived as a physical materialization of the virtual stock market. It is a building with a floating base, representing the stock market more than physically accommodating it. Typically, the base of a building anchors a structure and connects it emphatically to the ground. In the case of the Shenzhen Stock Exchange, the base, as if lifted by the same speculative euphoria that drives the market, has crept up the tower to become a raised podium, defying an architectural convention that has survived millennia into modernity, a solid building standing on a solid base. And here's the OMA illustration of that. <laughs> Lifted. And here's another OMA diagram showing the degree to which this building really is a symbol more than a physical accommodation, as they describe it, of the stock market. It is only this bottom section with the floating base and a few floors above and below it that is actually used by the stock exchange. The rest might be seen as there simply for a sense of scale and, of course, expensive real estate. But to get back to the listings hall, which is situated in the floating base section of the building. There is no actual trading floor in this exchange. The process of exchange takes place in a secured server farm located elsewhere in the building. Even if the servers were in plain sight, there wouldn't really be anything to see. For most of us, a server farm looks like a server farm. This is one of the first images that came up uh, in an internet search I did for server farm the other day. I couldn't really distinguish it from the one in Shenzhen. When I returned to the site in 2013, 
I spend most of my time in this space, the one designed for the media, and which is, in some way, a stand-in for, for the absent trading floor, where images like the ones from CCTV I showed earlier are made to accompany stories about the exchange. I thought a lot about the relationship of the screens hung here and the kinds of images that would appear on them once the exchange opened, as well as the kinds of images that the screens would themselves appear in, in stories about the exchange. So I'm gonna now show a brief excerpt, it's about three and a half minutes, from the project that came out of this, about a typical trading tactic that is deployed to try to dissolve or uh, dematerialize an image of a particular action in order to more effectively carry it out. What you will see is a series of shots of the LED screens in this hall. And what you will hear is my voice, so it will be a little bit strange. But uh, um, I don't know, the sound wasn't on that last clip. Okay. Let's see. try one more time and if it doesn't work then I will just read this from I actually brought the text and page. Uh, actually HDMI. Yeah, it's weird it's like a long in the box. Sometimes the because they because it goes through the HDMI the audio as well you know yeah so this might be the case it's strange uh, you put the microphone output in the is not working yeah so it when you take it out when yeah. you and you just hold your microphone here yeah. yeah. oh, okay okay yeah, yeah, yeah. Good chance all right that's cool that's but cool. we have to unplug this yeah uh, why is it not going out oh here I'll unplug it there no no, uh, no here. Have to unplug it here otherwise it, oh yeah switch yeah. to the yeah that's true okay this is good. Good. All right, so uh, we're gonna do this like kind of old school, I guess. Yes. I think it still won't come with the sound because of the. Let's see how this works. I'm gonna I'm gonna do this live voiceover then. <laughs> okay. When a trader wants to sell a large amount of a particular stock on a given market, they have a visibility problem. If the order is large enough, then it cannot be executed instantaneously. The sudden increase in supply will affect the pricing of the stock, and the seller will lose money because of this having to sell it at a lower price than it was possible to sell it at before the order was placed. So the challenge is to sell this huge amount of stock without anybody on the market knowing that it is being sold. A big action needs to be carried out on the surface of exchange invisibly. My timing is not perfect here. I don't remember if it cuts in there. I think it's supposed to. Okay, uh, it doesn't matter. A computer running a particular type of program is employed. The program is built around an algorithm which analyzes the current state of the market in relation to the stock that needs to be sold and then breaks up this huge order into many smaller ones, which it then puts on the market bit by bit as fast as it can, but as slow as it needs to be to remain invisible. 
No other traders should be able to see the whole that these bits are a part of. Each one should seem like an independent, unrelated, average size trade. A thousand tiny reflexes, rather than a single coordinated movement. But it is a single coordinated movement. And it's not like there is only one trader who is using this kind of program. So there are many of these large, consequential movements occurring through what appears as thousands of tiny, inconsequential moves. The only way to see these big moves on the surface of exchange is through a reconstruction of the smaller ones. Speed of communication is key here, as the faster the computer can access the market data, the prices, the more continuously it can take this data into account in determining its own actions. Basically, the computer program is able to get a clearer picture of the market the more often it can sample it. The more prices it knows, the higher the resolution of the market picture. But this is, of course, where noise comes in. Because with a higher resolution, the image is more detailed. But these details offer the pot potential for distraction. It may be helpful to know the texture of the material between the lights on a massive LED board like this one. But in most cases, when the screen is actually in use, this is probably just a distracting detail. Unnecessary, if not prohibitive, to seeing the image that these lights construct together. In relation to that image, this texture is just noise. But it's this noise that actually holds the image together here in this place. Oh, yeah, okay. So, one of the things I wanted to deal with was how this process of eliminating, minimizing, or filtering out noise gets repeated at different scales, both temporal and spatial. How the construction of a coherent image on the market presupposes a world of signals in the form of prices in relation to which all other forms are considered noise. The ideal efficient market is continuously and instantaneously encoding the world as a vast series of prices. Of course, it can't do this in a truly instantaneous manner, so it is designed to do it as fast as possible. Prices should appear already formed. If the encoding process could be seen, it would be too slow. What appears on these screens once they are filled with market figures are various figures of a world thus encoded. Both the process of encoding and the actual effect of this encoding, how it is extracted from, and then how it feeds back into from whence it came is left to appear elsewhere. Granted, this space was set up precisely to stage this relationship in the form of a bell ceremony, which typically begins and ends the trading day. So you have a group of people, representatives of a company that is on the threshold of entering a world of efficient pricing. They ring the bell, trading begins, and pictures are taken of them in front of a screen that will soon display market data graphics illustrating price relations. That screen stands between these people and the city below, visible through the glass wall behind it. It's a pretty direct staging of the relationship between market and world. Market as mediator, a machine for allocating resources. But this particular staging is from another era. It really is capitalism as religion, as Walter Benjamin already had described it in the 1920s. The bell has about as much to do with triggering the start of the trading day as the wine in the chalice at a Catholic mass has to do with the blood of Jesus Christ. They are both symbols of something that has already occurred. My mother's probably going to kill me for that one. So, so instead of this ceremony, which could easily be altered at any moment or stopped altogether, let's look at the physical structure, the cathedral in which it takes place. 
For while there may be limited and unreliable access to the interior of this building, its exterior stands there and was designed explicitly for all to see. Just as a quick little side note here, looking up cathedral in uh, the Merriam-Webster's dictionary, the example they give is actually not of a church, but a company which builds a cathedral in order to proclaim its place among the giants of finance. <laughs> so it is no surprise that the exterior is what the architects describe when speaking of the representational role of the building, that it is to, quote, represent rather than accommodate the stock exchange. The first and main aspect is the floating base, which is to figure in some way the speculative euphoria that drives the market, as they put it. It is lifted as if by this force. It is a figure here, like the ringing of the bell, which we know is no longer the actual signal to begin trading. We all know the podium is not actually controlled by the speculative euphoria of the market. But they also describe another aspect of the building. And this one does not involve an as if. It is rather a description of an aesthetic effect produced by a particular building material, the material in which the entire building is clad. A kind of glass that produces what is described as, quote, a mysterious crystalline effect. If we take the architects at their word and see this building as a representation of the stock market, this detail suggests precisely how they and their clients wish to see the relationship of this market to the world around it. The pretense of its efficiency in the allocation of resources is replaced by the pure aesthetic enjoyment of a mysterious effect. It is precisely this effect that carves out a space of representation from the space of actual social relations. And this threshold that it thus establishes is something which we cannot affect, something which we can only enjoy at the expense of, or by turning away from, the world around us. That's it. Thank you very much. Uh, next we have the Demystification Committee. Um, the Demystification Committee investigates the covert, extended systems of power that shape society. This exploration encompasses the study of platforms, legal frameworks, machines, and communication networks. Uh, they currently focus on the toxic relationship between finance, secrecy, and sovereignty, as well as the friction between communication networks and their physical surroundings. It is a framework for art and research. Thank you. Um, and thanks, Zachary, for your talk as well. That was great. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the capital, capital that accumulates without touching the ground of production as well. So I think there's some good themes there. Um, we're going to be discussing particularly the offshore face of finance, um, which is considered often a hidden face, but uh, we'd like to suggest and it's not necessarily super original, but it's a, it's a fundamental and foundational face of finance, so it's structural. Um, but before we do that, we'd like to begin in the Seychelles in 1978 um, with a couple of stories uh, that we can tell through some legal decrees that were passed there. So, uh, in the late 70s, a man called Giovanni Mario Ricci um, arrives in the Seychelles, having been uh, kicked out of Somalia, having been kicked out of Switzerland, and having before that been kicked out of Italy um, for some financial misdemeanors, shall we say. Um, and he's not a politician, but he seeks to gain political influence. Um, the Seychelles is a kind of fertile place. It's recently independent from UK rule at this time, uh, but he finds it hard to gain influence with the new president. Lucky for him, the new prime minister puts in place a coup and becomes the next president, uh, and uh, Ritchie is able to gain some influence um, in that way. Uh, France, Albert René uh, becomes the new, prime, uh, the new president. Um, Together, René and Ritchie pass, or kind of with Ritchie's influence, René passes the non-resident bodies corporate decree. Um, this decree uh, puts in place a situation where a certain company can uh, 
incorporate companies from abroad, from out of the Seychelles. Um, and these companies will not have to pay any tax, file any um, documents, or give any information about their kind of stakeholders. Right, so it's kind of, it's offshore as we know it. It's um, not necessarily uh, the first offshore law. It's definitely, definitely not the last, but it's an interesting one in the kind of history that comes behind it. Um, so Rene and Richie uh, incorporate uh, Setco, the Seychelles Trust Company, which is one of the only companies in the Seychelles that is allowed to incorporate these offshore companies. Right, so very, very conveniently um, for Richie, he and Rene get this little place of power. I just, I'm going to add something. Um, Richie happened to live very close to Rene. Happened. So, yeah, happened to live very close to Rene. So, um, his efforts in trying to become an acquaintance of the, um, the prime minister at the time um, were very, very well placed, also like physically, I think. That's the house of the president, and that might be Richie's uh, bungalow. Um, and um, it's also important to mention that um, the ground is fertile for a certain kind of uh, um, jurisdiction or for a certain kind of uh, laws to be passed. Let's say that um, this, this country, the Seychelles at this time, are um, strategically positioned, or they still are, they haven't moved, but um, strategically positioned in the context of um, Russia and the US um, in the late 70s. Um, and therefore, René's official government is a, let's say, like a puppet, puppet dictatorship or a, uh, a totalitarian government. He's, um, he's representing the only party that can run for election. And that happens for 15 years. So Rich's influence, um, on this prime minister and Rene's interest, personal interest, and Richie's personal interest, interest mean they um, can pretty much play with the idea of a state and pretty much play with the idea of uh, passing any sort of law that might advantage um, themselves. So just to give some sort of uh, background to why, yeah. uh, why the, that law was passed. Yeah, yeah, conveniently a government put in place by the Soviets, but then it gets loads and loads of money from an uh, FBI, CIA, um, monitoring station. So, interestingly, playing the financial game. Um, so, with Setco as an initial company uh, between Rene and Richie, uh, Richie also sets up GMR Group. This is their stunning logo. I really love it. Um, uh, which you may notice is his initials. So, there's no kind of um, no aggrandizement there at all. Um, he also sets up another, we show the GMR group now because it becomes interesting later in one of the um, things it produced. Uh, but for now, we want to talk about specifically two uh, other companies that Richie set up. One of them uh, has an acronym that you might know, the IMF. But it's not the monetary fund, it's the, what is it exactly? The International Monetary Financing. Yeah, so it's like, I'm Richie from the IMF, but not the IMF, but the IMF, but not the IMF, um, which is a really uh, important thing you'll see uh, basically offshore, that, that kind of ability to do that. Um, do you want to say something about the papers? Just that the idea is, um, again, that um, through that very initial law, the um, uh, non-resident bodies corporate decree, um, Companies can be set up in this moment in the Seychelles, they can be set up without an official representation in the country, and therefore they can um, take, let's say, any name without much scrutiny from also other countries. So Richie and Rene play with this. They incorporate the one company, the Setco, that can incorporate other companies. So they are sort of like an offshore provider in their own state, if you want, but also play with the very idea of setting up companies and um, leverage on the name of these companies. So the IMF um, might give some advantage to Richie in his uh, international business. Um, then they set up something else as well. Yeah. Um, they set up a further company that's kind of a little more nuanced maybe, but a, a lot more powerful. Um, and it's basically a path for Richie to become an ambassador, despite the fact that he is not 
uh, a kind of representative any particular state. So there's um, something called the Sovereign Military Order of Malta. It's an ancient organization of knights um, that's affiliated with the Catholic Church. Uh, it doesn't have a physical state, but it can offer passports. It's kind of re recognized as a sovereign state of its own. Um, and it has many diplomatic output posts to this day around the world. Uh, in the 70s, it doesn't have one in the Seychelles. Um, and through an acquaintance, Ritchie registers the Sovereign Order of St. John, Knights of Malta, Inc. in New York. And is able to present himself to Rene as a representative of the Knights of Malta. Um, he presents himself as the ambassador. Rene, of course, goes, yeah, you're the ambassador. Fine. He sticks pelmets on his car. He gets ambassadorial clothes. He's driving around town. And again, he sits in this place between kind of two powers, so between America and the Soviets, um, to be able to play with this. There are ambassadors of other countries there, and they are like, this is clearly horseshit. However, they, through the infighting, through the kind of lack of um, coherence, perhaps, around the world at that time, that he slips in the cracks, basically. He, he kind of moves through. Um, so we can talk about Richie for ages, because he's funny, um, although also terrifying, and we haven't told you any of the particularly awful things he's affiliated with. Uh, I leave that to your Googling. Um, but we have another decree to talk about. So we want to talk about one of the um, kind of indigenous plants of the Seychelles. Uh, the Coco de Mer. Um, the Coco de Mer is the world's largest nut. Uh, it grows only in the Seychelles. Um, the fruit of the male and female trees are comparable to aspects of the human anatomy. <laughs> and this has led uh, to a number of mythical beliefs to spring up around them. Do you want to chat? There's, yeah, there's one that we thought of mentioning. Um, there's a fantastic book published by GMR, the company that um, Richie set up the, um, in the Seychelles. And this book is called Seychelles Images, and it collects different kind of images from this uh, paradise. And in the book, there's a botanist that recalls this experience of going to one of the, um, there's a hundred islands that make up the Seychelles. So one of these islands has got all the trees uh, that produce these nuts. And um, this botanist goes to this one fantastic island uh, with a sorcerer and um, is shown how the reproduction happens, how the two plants actually um, produce the fruit, let's say. And um, this um, is a stormy night um, and um, the, the description, of, of course, is full of, is full of innuendo and... Uh, and the, the magician, the sorcerer, says, now do you believe me? Do you believe that these plants are magic and they can produce magic, uh, magic seeds? And um, the botanist writes that he couldn't not believe or unsee what he had seen. He couldn't uh, negate and he still cannot do so today. But he wonders whether any other naturalist would actually um, be willing to believe such an event um, and be, be willing to believe that these are really magical, uh, magical nuts. So um, at the same time as the non-resident bodies corporate decree, uh, the Seychelles passes a law called the Coco de Mer um, Management Decree. So this requires that the nuts, the, um, these massive kind of super collectible, uh, kind of magical almost um, fruits, are registered, right? They're very, very strongly regulated. Um, people who own the groves need to register how many trees they have. People who have whole nuts need to register those nuts. They get these stamps. Um, this is a more recent image where they move from kind of easily forgeable paper ones to holographic kind of anti-DVD piracy style ones. They're really great, again. Um, and so in this way, something magic the nut of the Coco de Mer is pulled down to the level of a bureaucratically controlled, restricted, but globally tradable commodity and something bureaucratic or something that we would consider bureaucratic, so a company, is kind of elevated to the mystical realm, right? These two decrees kind of flip the script within the Seychelles um, of those two things. Funny enough, the coconut is better regulated than the company in, in the Seychelles still today. So Seychelles is interesting to offshore, um, 
but it's also kind of interesting to us. Uh, we see in 78 the Seychelles uh, kind of a small group um, of individuals reshaping finance, kind of affecting global relationships between companies through this, um, using, using essentially the jurisdiction as a shield, right? And they kind of, kind of hide between things. Yeah, I think also interestingly, um, René, which is the, the prime minister, uh, presents himself as this sort of man that will solve the problem of the country, which is now just after independence, a few years after independence, um, and um, presents himself as this like sort of the, the leader of this sort of socialist revolution. But he then, talking to a CIA agent, says, I am red outside, but green inside. Uh, he's quoted saying this, green as in not like uh, eco green, green as in <laughs> money green, of course. Um, so he's, um, he's set up this situation or this kind of uh, framework through which uh, certain uh, financial movement and financial deregulation can happen. And of course he's doing so for a, a personal interest, but um, in doing so also makes the way or, or, or yes, makes the way for possible future movements and more aggressive um, global um, financial movements. And we happened to find the Seychelles as one of the possible um, countries that we wanted to uh, try and set up a company in. Um, the idea of um, setting up what we call an offshore investigation vehicle was very much one to come back to Ruth's point on um, the experience of Brett Scott, like uh, going uh, incognito in uh, um, was it stock exchange? Yeah. Um, we, we had a similar question. We wanted to sort of try and experience a little bit what it meant to go offshore. Um, and this brought up other questions, such as questions around the aesthetics of this place or the, um, the, um, the face of it, if you want, the one, what might be a face for offshore. And again, actually, you mentioned the, the sort of what's in your mind when you think of finance or when you think of money. And uh, a question we had at first was, you know, what, what do you think of if you hear offshore or uh, offshore finance or tax haven? Um, in Italy, we call them uh, sort of paradiso fiscal, a fiscal paradise, if you want. So the images we had in mind were, were, were very, very much beachware or maybe beaches more than beachware and like um, cocktails, palm trees and coconuts. And um, this was also an attempt to try and um, move away or break away from, that, from there. So anyways, we uh, decided to set up a series of companies that would allow us to um, step into um, this, this world that was very removed from us and we set up a, uh, a sort of tri triangular corporate structure that spans three seas and um, we start with a company that's at the top um, and it's called Aptly Empire Management, Empire Management Limited. This is a UK company, so it's the onshore part of the corporation um, and it's based here in, um, at the heart of the empire in London. Um, Importantly, this was the very first step and it was very interesting to set up a company in the UK where the amount of time and money required was very little. It was a couple hours and 12 pounds. But then we had to invest a lot more money and a lot more time to understand which offshore or secrecy jurisdiction we had to um, go to or we could go to. And um, we were in an interesting place where we really had to take at face value the deals that we encountered. So uh, we are looking for an offshore agent or an offshore provider and we're looking for um, the best possible deal. But there is uh, very little information actually that, that comes through. Um, and we end up looking at review, online reviews, and we find one for a company that offered a very good deal, competitive price on a Seychelles incorporation, and uh, this company at the time had mixed, mixed reviews. Um, the company very mixed, right? Very mixed, um, but it was also the one of the few we could afford. So we went for it. The company is called One Offshore Company. And um, recently, um, something funny happened. When I uh, checked the review again of the company, we, we saw a new one on the 5th of September. Um, great company, great service from Graham. And Graham is the guy I, had, I was dealing with. He's the uh, sort of CEO, you know, he's the offshore provider. 
that sits at the top of uh, one offshore company. So he signed up to this forum called the Offshore Corp Talk, which is effectively the only forum we found, or maybe it's not the only one, but it's the one we found um, being most reliable. And he, um, yeah, he sort of reviewed himself, gave, a, gave himself a five stars. Um, also, interestingly, we were approaching this from an, like, from the point of view of an individual, like we don't have access to the um, knowledge or um, to the same information that uh, larger corporations or companies have. So if you think of uh, the Panama Papers or the Paradise Papers, the offshore providers behind these leaks are uh, Mossack Fonseca or Appleby, and uh, these are large offshore provider uh, providers and there's a history of um, banks working with them. We couldn't access that sort of um, service. There's, of course, the main entry barrier is capital. And um, we had to use this um, different means, basically, like online reviews, as if you're looking for a restaurant. <laughs> we're very, yeah, we're very much at the low end. Google Maps sort of review it yeah. inside of offshore company. Anyhow, um, Graham helps us set up the first investigation or investment. We call the Invest One in the Seychelles. And um, it happens to be somewhere here. And so this is a part of Mahe, one of the main uh, islands in the Seychelles. And uh, Graham is an offshore provider, but he uses uh, a second provider. So this is a second proxy um, called AAA Services, uh, International Services. And so it's a second agent which effectively registered the company, registers the company in the Seychelles. They're a kind of modern version of Setco, so a modern version of Rene and Ritchie's company and corporation yeah. company. And finally, we set up a bank account um, so that the bank account is directly connected to the offshore company, and it's effectively the asset of the offshore company. Um, now, what's interesting about this is that the company in itself doesn't do much, but the Invest One, the company in the Seychelles, isn't directed by us. Even if we direct the company in the UK and we directly control the company in the Seychelles, we have a, a puppet director, and this is one of the loopholes that the um, Seychelles has written into its, uh, its legal code and its law. And this puppet director is called Mark Andrew Derek Farmer, which um, we like to read as Mad Farmer, and Mad Farmer signed a document um, which effectively gives us uh, access to the uh, asset, so to the bank account, and makes us beneficial owners. So there's um, something perhaps about faces here that's worth mentioning, the idea that the, first, the very first face of our corporate structure on shore is the UK company called Empire Management, and is by all means disconnected to anything else. Um, the face of the company offshore, if you can access this data, is Invest One. Uh, but then a second face or a second shield is Mad Farmer's face, the director, which represents us, and or, or I guess is like the legal shield, and so that we don't encounter any legal problems in doing whatever we might do with this company. Um, yeah, so the companies are then linked. Um, but together by a share certificate. So Empire Management owns a share in Invest One. Um, what might not be immediately clear to you guys here, having just kind of heard of the companies, uh, is that this is not where Empire Management is registered. So that image we showed you earlier um, is Brixton in London. Uh, when we get the share certificate, when our companies are linked together by our agent, we receive it registered to an address in Bedfordshire, another part of the UK, a farm, in fact. Um, and we query this with the agent, right? We say, this is not our address. There's a mistake. Can you take it back? Can you make a new one? And they're like, yeah, 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 sure, sure, sure. We'll fix it, we'll fix it. And we hear nothing for, I don't know, months, right? And then we ask them again recently, and they're like, oh, we're so sorry. We've made a mistake. We'll fix it for you and send the new one. We receive an email back with the PDF, uh, the corrected PDF, and it's exactly the same. So this is a mistake, but this is a mistake that helps us. And what we naively ask initially and why they kind of brush us off in the very, very first instance of these emails, we, we kind of think it's, it's wrong and we need to do things by the book. But of course, you don't do things by the book. We're offshore. Um, this, this mistake is another face, right? So not only is there the face that is empire management, it's kind of bifurcated, it's split, it's whatever, it's two, there's two empire managements now. 
yeah? And so that, that kind of ability to, to do that gives us a little more secrecy. I guess also um, what's interesting is that in like our original question was one around the also the aesthetic of offshore potentially and definitely one of its um, one of its faces is that of documents and uh, these documents hold a certain value now, according to where they are assessed from they hold a different value so um, they're all true in a way um, but that truth is relative to who is assessing or where the truth is being assessed from um, and we wanted to play um, similarly with this idea of um, encoding mistakes or at least encoding intentions in some of the documents that we could produce. Um, we can't produce documents offshore because the company is effectively managed by a service provider, but we can produce documents onshore. So we set up the company and we use it with our um, shareholders and we um, we have a series of documents. Um, we hold meetings, take minutes, and uh, have resolutions, and we have a series of documents that we have to put on the UK company's house. It's a legal requirement. And so um, one of the ones that we put recently, that's company's house in the UK, if I can. Uh, um, this is one of the resolutions that we put up, and um, we effectively state that we are going to use our company to um, save some money on um, taxes by uh, selling beachware and using our own offshore structure um, to effectively pay 0% taxes, because that's one of the other loopholes of the Seychelles, one of the advantages of this tax haven. Um, so we are trying to, to clarify these intentions on these documents and almost um, play with the idea of uh, companies house as an online gallery if you want um, yeah and there's a kind of face at which you kind of initially meet lots of financial information but g in general the companies there don't show their intentions right you don't reveal your corporate secrets you don't reveal your financial secrets it, you wouldn't um, but we're in a position where we we can we can bring these things out from the depths of our admittedly small corporate structure up to the face of companies house um, they haven't complained about it though. They sent it back twice because the text wasn't legible, right? Mm -hmm. um, but they were completely happy with it, saying that we were going to avoid tax. So there we go. Um, yeah. yeah, no? So, so we kind of, we like, we, our intention is to exploit some of the, the aspects of existing institutions, of, of corporations and finance. So we, we play the game of having meetings and having shareholders in some ways. Um, but we also play with uh, the visual codes of offshore and, and the ways that we can kind of make them public um, and, and show them. Uh, and this kind of goes along with, but slightly against something that you would do in general with offshore finance. And this is actually something that Brett Scott kind of put us onto. Um, this idea of a risk return profile. So corporations carefully tune the face value of their company so the more offshore subsidiaries you have, of course, the more complex your financial movements are and the harder it is for anyone to see and the more probability you have to avoid paying the taxes that you are supposed to. But if you make it too complex, it's very, very obvious what you're doing, right? Pre specifically, if you go to the Seychelles, which is one of the most corrupt <laughs> countries for it and generally highlights everything. Um, and so this, there's this balance to be made between the complexities of, um, uh, of being able to avoid um, tax, but also not, uh, not pulling yourself into, I can't think of the word, uh, not making it super obvious, basically. Yeah, not exposing yourself. Yeah, that's the thing. So it's kind of a system that's made up of many shifting territories and relationships, um, and it allows you to make these errors in there, but it's a careful balance to not make too many. I think. Fantastic. So we have really a lot to think about there and really from very, uh, the work has very different kind of feeling actually and doing different kinds of things. So um, please ask us some questions or make comments. There's uh, microphones lined up on either side of the room uh, so that we can hear you. Um, while you're letting things settle and deciding what it is that you want to hear more about, um, the thing that, 
This morning I was in a I was in another panel and um hang on, I just need to find my notes. And uh it was something Sven Lutigen said that I thought was quite kind of it, it still feels quite pertinent. So contemporary art is kind of part of the economic vanguard. You know, it's kind of bleeding edge of capitalism in some ways, in that it's doing itself in art, is doing these odd movements with uh, value and invisibility and making certain things obscure and other things visible. I think that there's these connections. Um, so I just kind of wonder how your kind of study of finance, what, what, do you feel it gives you any particular insights on kind of what the role of the contemporary artist is? I think there's a, like, we're, as an artist, you're problematically implicated in these things. Or perhaps maybe we would be if we made any money. I don't know if that makes any difference Th to is, it. That, is that important? So would the making of money make you more implicated? I think potentially, because the, um, the making of money, I, my understanding from a particular point of view is that as, it, as, you, as you kind of, you can, you can pass art around as a commodity but your art has to be commodified and commoditizable for that, perhaps. And that there's a question as to whether you allow it to be, whether you can have any control over that. You might not be able to have any control over that at all. Um, and whether that then does mean that you're implicated in the movements of finance that then occur as a result of the things you've put into the world. Um, and I don't know if that's something that I'm just kind of assuming, having never done it, and it's actually fine, but it, you know, I don't, I don't know whether that changes. Do you, do you think that the fact that your work is about finance mm. makes you think about your makes you think about your role as artists in a different way to other artists that you encounter? Quite possibly. I mean, we have dual roles in some ways. Like we we are artists, but we're also capitalists in this situation of this project right we have to flip into that mode as business people i think just going back Bad to ones. the idea of um, uh, implication i think the system we set up doesn't um well the system we set up allows for a certain financial stress if you want like it it can take it could take a a, a certain amount of money um but maybe with that extra stress would also comes extra scrutiny of its many faces. So um, currently, there is very little money involved because of the movements that we are doing. Um, but I think also we sort of well, I, I wouldn't say we want to be implicated, but we want to play with this idea of being implicated and potentially um, using the spaces that are given to us or that are given to let's say, um, corporations, or using the norms of corporate law to um, have a conversation about these issues. And so the online company's house website becomes an online gallery um, as a way to both explore potential visual language of, of, uh, of offshore, but also as a way to um, further, I don't know, expand or, or, or explore um, some of the implications of uh, these financial movements. Yeah. And uh, just to pursue with this, do, do, you, uh, do, do you invest any time at all in thinking about how you could actually make some serious money through your company? People ask us quite often this question. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we haven't invested much time thinking about how to make actual money. Um, We've had a couple of harebrained schemes that didn't really fly when, when we thought through them, right? We kind of wanted to sell um, corporate directorships at one point, which we couldn't quite find any buyers for, uh, possibly because maybe the business cards that we could have offered weren't up to scratch, maybe we didn't have the right titles, I don't know. Um, what else were we going to do? Yeah, I think we haven't considered it as a 
a full money making exercise. It's kind of a small model of one. I think it, it's an attempt to put something in place that we can flush minimal amounts of capital through um, to see how it responds at different points rather than necessarily to, to kind of see what happens when you accumulate a massive amount of capital at the end in your uh, offshore account and use it to buy yourself a car. Or many cars, yeah. <laughs> I guess it's just, a, it's an interesting question, I think, to think about to what degree you really feel something until you're, until you're actually experiencing the same kind of motivations. And uh, um, it reminds me of Bertel Ullman's book about, uh, um, what was it called? Marxism is the name of the game. It wasn't called that. It was something like that. He, he kind of made a game about Marxism and then became a capitalist trying to sell it. It was a, a kind of really funny inversion, and that, but you get this kind of sense of real stress. Um, so, I just want to yeah. Yeah, just quickly throw something in about this. I'm based in the Netherlands, and uh, there you basically, if you're an artist, you have to kind of set up uh, a little company. You know, you have to set up a one-person uh, business uh, and register like that. And I mean, so that's kind of just a banal reality of how it works. Uh, but it of course means that you, like for me, for example, then like the whole income situation and everything is kind of filtered through that, you know, so, you, so you, yeah, like your whole life becomes, I mean, of course it depends, like we were talking earlier, like what kind of, uh, employment you have out of that. So if you're teaching or something, you have some other stream of income where it's a more like a waged labor situation, uh, then um, it's maybe less the case. But if your primary income is from art, whether that's like, uh, you know, selling work or getting grants or whatever, then uh, yeah, you are constantly kind of thinking in this, mo no matter what the, the art what form it is, what it's about, whatever, you know, so it's not just about like making a commodity that can be sold on the market, but also like a, pre I mean, yeah, like I, I rarely sell stuff, but I have to constantly think about how money is going to be raised for this and that, and when it gets too much in a production budget, is it going to, you know, cause tax problems and all this kind of stuff. So I think that's just part of the banality of like having of living in the current situation, you know, that, that you, yeah, you, you, uh, you have to think of yourself, it's this thing of thinking of yourself as an entrepreneur, even if you hate that. It's like there's certain as entrepreneurial things, accounting, all this stuff that you're kind of forced into uh, adopting. Yeah, like like we heard in the auditorium this afternoon, that the kind of we we are forced to consider ourselves as financialized beings, like fully financialized beings, yeah. all the time. I really the the this thing of the kind of flipping from magic to bureaucracy with the big kind of nut. Uh, thing I thought I really kind of I, I if there are artists in this room I wonder how many really kind of identify with this a kind of bureaucratization of what it is to be an artist certainly like I run a publicly funded arts organization and the bureau with the I don't recognize myself you know I didn't I didn't sign up to be a full-time bureau twat and that is what I now am and uh, so but that that flipping is really interesting I think there's um, an interesting we have a favorite book called banking in silence um, written by well written pseudonymously pseudonymous there yeah, whatever by a guy called WG Hill um, and he uh, it's kind of full of tips and tricks about how to bank in silence, how to secretly move money around. But he, he really rails against the bureau rats, as he terms them in it. So even within that world of bureaucracy, or what, what I would consider to be like bureaucratization of and financialization of everything, is what offshore in some ways seems to me to be, um, even there, there's a hatred of bureaucracy. Like, I, I don't know where the, who loves bureaucracy, but everyone does it, right? I guess it comes with, with, with art, with finance, with whatever, but. I think machines make it worse. Machines yeah. really yeah, generate definitely. a lot of bureaucracy. Um, I really, it's really hard to see people. Do 
leap up and shout if you have something you want to say. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yes, hey. I would like to ask um, the demystification committee one question in regard um, to Paolo. Is it Sirios or Kyrikos? Kyrio? Paolo Kyriko? Uh, Lupov. What? Chirio. Chirio. Paolo Chirio's work, uh, Loophole for All. Uh, and how would you describe the, um, like, the seemingly relation between your project and his um, projects conceptually and formally. Is that question clear? Yeah, yeah thanks. Uh, yeah, I think there's, a, there's, of course, a thematic similarity and we know and we love that project. It's a, it's a really fantastic project. He essentially, for, I, I presume a lot of people know it, but in case you don't, he expropriates um, the registration certificates of a series of offshore jurisdictions. So he extracts. Okay, the Cayman, Cayman is it just Cayman Islands? Yeah. Okay. He extracts like thousands and thousands of company certificates and then says, okay, on the face value of this certificate, on owning it, you um, are able to. Uh, you're able to move. You're able to basically say you own this company if you hold this certificate, and then he. he distributes it democratically, essentially for like a, a euro or something, right? You can buy a thing. Um, so there, there's that kind of going into these systems and pulling out all the information that is already there and kind of working against those who exploit them. And then I suppose ours goes in in a much more personal way or, or starts to, I guess. It's, you know, it's maybe not fully complete yet. Um, and looks at the way that we can kind of implicate ourselves within the system and kind of ape or, or, or duplicate the things that people might use it for. But I think also something interesting about Chiro's project was that you could take at face value his project very much. So there is the, the idea of you know, me being able to buy a certificate for a dollar or whatever it is uh, doesn't necessarily explain, not to say that, not to undermine the project, but doesn't necessarily explain some of the interesting tricks um, which are then used or you know sold to you by offshore service provider. So in a way, I um, I was struggling to understand how some of um, or how to make use, for example, safely um, of these uh, certificates that I could have bought from uh, Loophole for All. And um, as as we said, um, the, the project we started was one that was um, partially experiential and also trying to. Um, emancipate ourselves in understanding a little bit how this world works and exposing that. And um, for example, things such as uh, nominee directorship or uh, um, understanding uh, how flexible the um, offshore provider is in that they keep moving and there keeps being new documents being produced and new faces being created um, kind of helped me at least also understand um, that there's a certain stress that these companies can take that I maybe wasn't, um, or that these structures can take that I wasn't so aware of before. And um, I guess the, the project that we try to uh, do um, also revolves around this idea of um, grasping some of this knowledge from, from within. Um, so perhaps that answers the question. Okay, I have one last question for all of you guys. Um, how, does, how do your subjects view what you are doing? What's, the, where, yeah, what's your kind of relationship? Because I suspect you probably have quite different relationships with your subjects. Because there's a very kind of, but your work very, seems very poetic. And uh, yeah, so do, are they, are the subjects of the Shenzhen Stock Exchange aware of what you're doing and kind of how would they regard it? How do they regard it? Who are the subjects Who of the Shenzhen they? Stock yeah. Exchange? Uh, I don't, what do you mean, the people I mean, working there? Did, yeah, do, do they know what you do? Who knows what you're doing and what do they make of it? Um, well, very few people there know. Uh, working in the stock exchange knew what I mean the first time I was there it's a little bit trickier to talk about the second time but the first time I got access to it through the architects 
Uh, and so then I was there on site uh, with a, you know, you have to have a hard hat with okay. a company and whatever. And so there, then I was there like as a, as a architectural photographer. I was doing documentation. So you're kind for of the, incognito. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Um, so, so yeah, that's kind of, uh, and then you're just like, you're just like, and everybody on site has a job. Right. You're not on a construction site without a job. Then you're not, you're not yeah. allowed. So, so you just play that role. Uh, for me, that was the, you have to kind mm. of do that. You can't be too, or you won't be okay. allowed on. So, so it, that made it easy for, okay. for me. And it was like a big part of why the first part of that piece uh, was about architectural photography, really. This like particular type of kind of, of architectural photography of construction sites. Um, because that's, yeah, that's, yeah, that's what I was when I was on the site. So you're, you're, in a way, you're very removed from, from the kind of core subject of, your, of the work. You're kind of right at the... Well, I think in the second, the second time I was there, the subject were, were, were these machines. Yeah. You know, it was the machine. It was the, the, and the building as this kind of embodiment of the machine. Uh, so I felt like I got really close to those screens. Uh, and that they were the same as the servers and all that. I had gotten into the server farm, which is part of why I like can't really, yeah, it, it got like really not a good situation because I kind of went where I wasn't supposed to go. Uh, and That's what we want to know about. <laughs> yeah, then, <laughs> what happens when you go where you're not supposed to go? Well, then you get relegated to just filming screens. Right, okay. That's basically what happened. So it was like, okay. okay, you can be in the listings hall where the like public media thing is and that's where you can be. Okay. So so I could do like the this facade going up and I could do the screens and the bell and you know, it was Okay. <laughs> so that's Thank what you. happens. <laughs> and you guys, what's your yeah, how we are have, you regarded? We have a very virtual relationship actually with almost everyone. I think. So we spoke with Graham via email. You called him maybe once? What level of disclosure, though, are we talking about? Is it From us? Very, yeah. No, no we, we are... I mean, they don't care. Yeah. They're, they're offshore, okay. right? They don't want to know. Their whole job okay. is to not know. So there's um, KYC, know your customer sort of practices. Therefore, they want to know the bare minimum, I'd say, um, that... They, they want to know that we're not criminal, let's put it that way. We had two interesting encounters. One was uh, online through Skype. Um, we had a, an interview with um, a senior manager of the bank that is the Euro-Pacific Bank, where we have the bank account for Invest One, And um, he was asking to, um, to know why we wanted this bank account and what we were going to do with it and how much money there was going to be. All questions that we were totally unprepared for, obviously. <laughs> and um, um, interestingly, uh, his sorry, his his assumption on what we sort of muddled through with with kind of loose awareness of art and design things and whatever. He 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 decided that we were probably doing CAD modeling, right? Okay. Yeah, because he he heard the word like art and then. Yeah. You know, so we tried to disclose. But we, try, we, we tried to put it in a way where he was asking what the relationship of Invest One and uh, potential customers would be. Um, and we say that we would, as Invest One, be doing um, procurement services. So we would help potential customers producing art goods uh, produce this and effectively procure this, uh, these goods. And it was sort of enough. He asked to see a document that we then made. Um, a legal document, or totally legal document that we made and we showed him to prove the relationship in between UK and the Seychelles company. And um, it, it was a, a very sort of removed uh, interaction. I think that's, that's kind of important, right? The, that you do have to disclose a lot. It's a lot harder to get an offshore company than an onshore company. So you have to prove you're not going to money launder uh, you're not going to finance any terrorists, whereas in the UK, we just had to give our names and £12. Um, and so there is a lot of documents that we had to provide, but they get provided at that moment of formation, and then psh, they right. potentially okay. disappear. So they know who we are, but not necessarily what we're doing, I guess. File and forget as uh, banking in silence, <laughs> closing chapter puts it. File and forget. 
That's our closing statement for tonight. Thank you very much.